The first notes for our ecology unit are on the principles of ecology. Ecology is the study of the interactions among living things and between living things and their surroundings. It's pretty much the study of nature. There are levels of organization in ecology, and we're going to start by working from the smallest and working our way out to the whole earth. So the first level is an organism, and an organism is an individual living thing. Like in this picture, there is an alligator. The next level is a population. A population is a group of the same species that lives in one area. So it's important with a population to define the area. You can't just say something like, there are 300 alligators. Well, where are those alligators? Is that how many there is in the world or in a certain area? So here, there would be four alligators in this swamp. That is how you would define population. The next level out is a community. It is a group of different species that live together in one area. So if we're looking at the swamp, we can say there are turtles and fish and eagles and cranes and there's grass and trees and all these organisms that are going to make up the community of the swamp. The next level is ecosystem, which includes all the organisms of the community as well as abiotic things, which are non-living things. Climate, soil, water, rocks other things that describe the ecosystem. When we think of an ecosystem, we can also think of things like the water cycle and just the balance that is involved. Moving out from ecosystem, we have biome. It is a major regional or global community of organisms characterized by the climate conditions and plant communities that thrive there. And so biomes are gonna be more general areas and you're going to have common ones throughout the world. So you can have an ecosystem of a very specific area, but then it can also be part of a larger biome. Examples of biomes would be aquatic, desert, tundra, forest, um, and so those are things that are biomes. We move out all the way, we get to the biosphere, and it is the sum of all biomes on Earth. This includes all living organisms on Earth as well as any dead mat organic matter. And our biosphere is the planet Earth. Some terms that you can use during this unit are biotic and abiotic. Biotic factors are living things. We know bio means life, so biotic are living. This includes plants, animals, fungi, and bacteria, and each play a particular role in the ecosystem. Biotic factors would also be once living things, so any dead organic organisms are still going to be considered biotic. Abiotic factors are non-living things, and they were never living. These are things like moisture, temperature, wind, sunlight, soil. We can use these to describe an area, and these are things that make ecosystems very different. The balance of these things will help determine what living things can survive in a particular area. So for example, a tree frog or a fern that needs a lot of moisture, neither of those organisms could live in this environment in this picture. Biodiversity is the assortment or variety of living things in an ecosystem. Biodiversity is super important. The amount of biodiversity in an area will depend on many factors, including moisture and temperature. The less extreme an area is, the more biodiversity it will have. So if it's not incredibly dry and it's not incredibly hot or cold, it's going to have more biodiversity. Rainforests, which are very temperate, they don't have extreme temperatures, and they have a ton of water, which all organisms need, they are going to have more biodiversity than any other locations in the world. However, they are threatened by human activities, which is reducing their biodiversity. Some other terms you will need to know that have, have to do with our um, food chain and how energy is passed through the food web. So the first term is producers. These are organisms that get their energy from non-living resources, such as the sun. In other words, they're going to produce their own food. They are also called autotrophs because they make their own food. Auto means self, and troph means nourishment or feeding, so they are self-feeding. They do not need to eat something. Consumers are organisms that get their energy by eating other living or once living resources. They are also called heterotrophs because they feed off of different things. Hetero means different, so they are different feeders. They are not self-feeders. 
Within the category of consumer, we have a lot of different types. Herbivores are going to eat only plants. Carnivores are going to eat only animals. Omnivores eat both plants and animals. And decomposers, such as bacteria and fungi, are going to break down organic matter into simpler compounds. Producers are extremely important. All ecosystems depend on producers because they provide the basis for the ecosystem's energy. Even animals that only eat meat rely on producers if you, chase it, um, if you trace it far enough back. So this mountain lion right here, it is going to rely on these producers because these animals eat these animals that are going to eat this. All consumers are connected in some way to producers. Just to review, photosynthesis is the process by which organisms use sunlight as their energy source to produce carbohydrates. Photosynthetic organisms like plants, bacteria, some protists, they're going to use carbon dioxide and water to produce simple sugars, and they release oxygen gas as a waste product. Chemosynthesis is similar to photosynthesis. It is the process by which an organism forms carbohydrates using chemicals rather than light as an energy source. Chemosynthetic organisms often live in deep sea vents and sulfur-rich marshes. A food chain links species by their feeding relationships, and it follows the connection between one producer and a single chain of consumers within an ecosystem. This is actually how we can show how energy is transferred through an ecosystem. Food webs are models that show the complex feeding relationships and energy flow in an ecosystem. At each link in a food web, some energy is stored within an organism, and then some energy is dissipated into the environment as heat. And what we mean by that is some of that energy is going to be stored in, you know, the muscle and fat of the organism, and another organism can eat it and get that energy. But a lot of the energy is just going to be used by the organism, and so that energy is going to spread out into the environment as heat. Trophic levels are the nourishment levels in a food chain. Energy is going to flow up the food chain from the lowest trophic level to the highest. Producers are going to make up the bottom trophic level, always. Primary consumers are herbivores that eat producers. Secondary consumers are carnivores that eat herbivores. And tertiary consumers are carnivores that eat secondary consumers. So if we look at our pyramid here, this bottom level with these grasses, these are our producers. Then these prairie dogs that eat the producers, they're herbivores, but they are known as primary consumers. They're the first eaters. These weasels that eat the prairie dogs are secondary consumers, and they're going to be carnivores. And then this owl up here that eats the weasels is a tertiary consumer. Omnivores, such as humans that eat both plants and animals, may be listed at different trophic levels in different food chains. So in other words, when you eat a salad, that lettuce, you're going to be a primary consumer because you're eating a producer. But if you have chicken on that salad, you would be a secondary consumer because you are eating a primary consumer. Consumers that eat tertiary consumers are called quaternary consumers. This is going to happen especially in aquatic food webs. Energy pyramids compare energy used by producers and other organisms on trophic levels. We have something called the 10% rule, and what this says is up to 90% of the energy in each trophic level is lost to the, into the atmosphere as heat. So what that means is this grass, it's making glucose for itself, but it's going to use that glucose. It's going to use about 90% of it to just kind of run its body. Um, we can think of, you know, grass as a body organism. Um, and only 10% is going to be passed to the next level. These prairie dogs, they're going to use the food they eat, the grass they eat, to run their body. And it's going to be lost to the atmosphere as heat. And only 10% gets passed to the next level. So what we can do with this is we can actually do a little bit of math. So let's say on this bottom level there was 800,000, we'll say kilojoules of energy. Because 90% is lost and only 10% gets passed on, the next level would have 80,000 kilojoules of energy. 
90% will get lost, so the next level will have 8,000 kilojoules of energy. And our last level, our tertiary consumer, would have 800 kilojoules of energy. There are two other pyramids that we can look at. One is the pyramid of biomass. Biomass is a measure of the total dry mass of organisms in an area. And it's going to show the mass of primary consumers required to support secondary consumers, secondary to support um, tertiary, and so on. What this is showing is to feed a tertiary consumer like this human, we are going to need more fish. To feed each of these fish, we are going to need more fish on the level below. And to feed these fish on the level below, we are going to need a ton of producers. Instead of biomass, we can do a pyramid of numbers, but it shows the same thing. If there are five mountain lions, there's going to need to be about 5,000 secondary consumers on the level below them so that the mountain lions can eat, but also so that those secondary consumers can survive and reproduce. There's going to need to be about 500,000 primary consumers on the level below that and 5 million producers on the level below that. We're going to switch gears and talk about cycles now. Biogeochemical cycles are going to track the movement of a particular chemical through the biological and geological parts of an ecosystem. So a great example of one that you are probably familiar with is the water cycle, which is shown here. So we can track that water through animals and through plants that are actually going to take water into their systems. That would be the biological part. And then the geological parts as well, surface runoff, stored in the ocean, underground, and the condensation and precipitation are all going to be geological parts of the ecosystem. The two we're going to learn about for this unit are the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. The carbon cycle is going to move carbon from the atmosphere through the food web and back to the atmosphere. Producers are going to convert carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into organic material that becomes part of the plant structure. So these plants do photosynthesis, and yes, they're going to make glucose to kind of run their bodies, but they're also going to make cellulose, which is going to actually make up the structure of plants, including trees. Carbon moves through the biotic world as one organism eats another. So when a primary consumer eats these plants, then that carbon is going to be taken into them and going to be used to build up their structure as well. And when something eats the primary consumer, that carbon is going to move to the next organism. Carbon is returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide by respiration or through the decomposition of dead organisms. Carbon is also emitted during the burning of fossil fuels. So respiration is going to happen with organisms on land as well as organisms in the water, and they are going to emit carbon dioxide. When decomposition of organisms happen, they will actually do aerobic respiration, bacteria will, and they will also release carbon dioxide. And then of course, when we combust fossil fuels, the fossil fuel that was underground storing carbon has now been released into the atmosphere. Some carbon is stored for long periods of times in areas called carbon sinks. Forest land stores large amounts of carbon in the cellulose of wood. So like we said earlier, you know, when they do photosynthesis, they're taking that carbon dioxide in the air and turning it into cellulose. So this whole area here is just storing a ton of carbon in the wood. Oceans can dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide in them. And then, of course, fossil fuels are going to store a lot of carbon underground. One of the reasons we talk about sinks and where carbon is stored is because we had these things stored for a long time that weren't really moving through the cycle. But as we do things like deforestation or burning of fossil fuels, we're actually releasing a lot more carbon dioxide into the air that we've never done in the past because they were stored in these sinks. The nitrogen cycle is another important cycle, and it's going to take place mostly underground, which you can actually see a lot of the information is here underground. Nitrogen fixation is the process by which certain types of bacteria convert gaseous nitrogen into ammonia. So in our atmosphere, actually 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, N2. But plants can't use nitrogen in that form. They need to use it in the form of ammonia. And so nitrogen-fixing bacteria 
underground is going to go through a process where it actually is going to convert the nitrogen into a form that plants can use. Some nitrogen fixing bacteria live in nodules on the roots of plants. Nitrogen is going to move through the food web and return to the soil during decomposition. Nitrogen is taken up by plants from the soil. And so as an organism eats the plants, that nitrogen is going to be used to help build proteins in their body because proteins are made with nitrogen. And then as organisms consume other organisms, they will get the nitrogen um, from the muscles of their, those organisms and help them to build up proteins in their own bodies as well. Natural disruptions are going to occur in these cycles, and they're natural because they're not really caused by humans. Things like earthquakes, volcanic disruptions, um, variations in weather, and changes to water movement can all affect these cycles. Volcanic eruptions and forest fires are going to release a lot of carbon and nitrogen into the atmosphere. Plants and animals will mess with these cycles, decomposers, and then landslides can alter the earth and change the course of rivers, burying or releasing carbon, nitrogen, and other chemicals. Human actions can disrupt both biogeochemical cycles and ecosystems, and the two examples we're going to talk about are poor farming practices and burning fossil fuels. Agriculture is really important, that's farming. It's responsible for growing most of the foods that humans eat, as well as many products needed for industry. However, some runoff from agriculture can actually affect ecosystems. So animal waste, which is full of bacteria from feedlots, leaches into groundwater and runs off into rivers, lakes, and streams. And then fertilizer contaminated runoff is gonna enter bodies of water. The problem with fertilizer is it's plant food, which you might think, well, extra plant food, why is that an issue? When it runs off into water though, it, what it will do is instead of feeding plants, it will feed algae and it will lead to algae blooms where we get a ton of algae in a very short amount of time. But after the algae bloom, all that algae is going to die and it's going to deplete the oxygen and kill fish and other aquatic life in that area, leading to dead zones. Burning of fossil fuels is an issue because it's going to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that was previously stored in that underground sink as oil. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It actually has the ability to hold on to heat. And so the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the more heat is held on to, which is going to steadily increase the temperature of the earth. Things that are going to burn fossil fuels would be cars, factories, and power plants.